welcome to Audiobooks from Hell. I am Sean DeRager, and uh, today I'm very excited to have John Peyton Cook on uh, on the podcast. I just released uh, his book, Out for Blood, has been out on Valancourt for a while, and the audiobook version that I narrated uh, has been out for a couple weeks now. So, uh, John, thank you so much for joining me, and so we can talk about the book and, and your, your writing career. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. I got to say, like, I am very happy with kind of how my portfolio is working out with the books I've been able to narrate. But I think Out for Blood, um, hands down, is probably one of my favorite books I've narrated. And as a narrator, it's hard to play favorites because, you know, I work for so many authors and I don't want to hurt, hurt anyone's feelings. But, but I, I just really loved this take on vampires, especially. Um, so I wanted to th- th- thank you in person, you know, for writing this because I absolutely loved it. Uh, no, no, thanks a lot. I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, I meant it to be entertaining and a lot of people over the years have, have in, enjoyed it. So thanks. <laughs> um, I, wa- I just wanted to start off with kind of the history of it because it, it was released in 1991. I know is early in your writing career, I believe, um, just kind of looking over things. But um, what what was kind of the genesis for Out for, Out for Blood, especially, and, and what was... You know, what, what kind of drew you into into the horror genre, especially? Well, um, I'd say that I grew up reading horror. Uh, so the uh, the fad today for the paperbacks from hell, um, <laughs> I lived through that. So I was reading all those paperbacks, not all of them. There were thousands, but I read many of them. And that's what I grew up reading. Of course, Stephen King was huge and he influenced the boom. So I was reading Stephen King as well as, you know, other authors who were publishing. So my whole, you know, goal in life was to be a paperback horror author. Um, and then this was my second novel. Um, and I was interested in vampires from an early age, mostly from movies, but also of course from Dracula. Um, and everyone does vampires differently and I had my own opinions about it. So I had worked up a whole lot of opinions about vampires over the years, <laughs> and I've wanted to work those into a novel. Uh, but I wanted it to be from the vampires' um, point of view. Yeah, and and that, I think it's what I <clears throat> what I loved about it, uh, especially was kind of the the mythology, um, and that it is a thing that our main character Chris does wrestle with, but it's not necessarily a huge curse. I mean. I loved seeing it from that perspective of, for him especially, this was something that actually saved his life because we have a character that, you know, is diagnosed with leukemia, he's struggling, he's weak, and then, you know, he, he when he becomes a vampire, that's his cure, and then he has to learn, kind of, you know, learn how to operate at, in this new world as as a vampire. And I just loved how you set things up as, um, it's not a crazy, horrific uh, tale and a thing that he has to wrestle with. It's actually a you know it it he loves, he's actually enjoying this journey. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that part of my opinion uh, that led to this book was I didn't want to write a book where the vampire was riddled with angst over being a right. vampire. Um, and one of the classic tropes of vampire fiction is that you're essentially giving up your soul. You know, it's sort of a demonic uh, um, pact you're entering into becoming a vampire. And um, so there's the question of, well, do I have a soul to begin with, you know, to trade? And no one knows. And so he doesn't know. He's a Catholic boy and he doesn't really know. Does he have a soul or not? Um, but it was more important for him to stay in some form of existence. And, um, uh, yeah, so this was a welcome opportunity. Um, but then I wanted him to also realize there were definite trade-offs and he had to Mm -hmm. learn what he would be trading, (laughs) um, um, for it. But I basically see the vampires as just another species and, um, Mm -hmm. they have to exist in their own way. Um, and so when he transformed from being a human to vampire, he had to learn the rules. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's that part of that part of the uh, the discovery was just a uh, I, I absolutely adored kind of getting into the character's head, uh, narrating it, narrating it from his, his perspective. And, and as and he, as he was learning these these rules along the way and and, and failing, you know, <laughs> at meeting some of these rules with one of his uh, his first encounters. Um, I don't I definitely do not want to spoil anything for uh, for our listeners, because uh, this is. I definitely want to, them to be surprised as well. But, um, but what I, I love, I love horror that operates on a level of, um, like more psychological, like, 
this is definitely this horror aspects to it, but it's also kind of a um, a little bit of a fish out of water tale. There's definitely um, some uh, romance in there. Um, it just kind of goes the wide gambit of not just, I'm going to tell the scary tale about vampires. Was this something intentional? Did you, um, what was your in, kind of intentions with this story in particular, especially, um, with the, the, the leukemia aspect? Sure. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I certainly intended to write a vampire novel and wasn't necessarily thinking that it was going to scare the pants off of people. I mean, uh -huh. um, you know, when you read a book like The Shining or Salem's Lot, classic, very scary novels, um, I wasn't trying to go for that. Um, but, you know, you write a vampire novel, you know, it's going to be marketed in horror. And I wanted there to be horrific aspects to it. Uh -huh. um, and I wanted the villain to be somewhat horrific in that he is an immortal human who is feeding off of the, the vampires. But since I wanted to tell the story from the vampire's point of view, I felt that it was important for the main character to be likable. Um, and so I worked really hard at that. And hopefully it doesn't show, but, but um, most people said they really liked the character. So that helps people kind of get in the groove and follow along the story um, because he's someone that people can relate to and kind of enjoy spending time with. Um, but I wanted to bring in a historical aspect um, of it. I wanted my vampires to be Russian because I had this interest in Russian history. I brought some Russian history into the book, which, um, you know, I, I don't know if it worked that well, but it was what I wanted to do. And I, and that was me wanting to flex my writing muscles mm -hmm. and see if I could write a uh, historical story. Um, um, so there was some things I wanted to do just to sort of, tr um, try my hand at, something different. My first novel was a contemporary horror novel set in a small town. Um, and this one I wanted to challenge myself a, okay. little, a little more. But yeah, I, I wanted the character to be well-rounded. I wanted um, there to be a romance aspect. Of course, he's a gay um, young man as well, which which um, I am and was. And, um, and I wanted people to not be turned off by that either. So I wanted them to relate and um, and sympathize and empathize with Chris's uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's what I, that was the perspective. I love that perspective because, um, he's just, he, he's a, he's a gay character. Like that's it. That's, that's who he is. And there's, you're seeing it through his eyes and through, you know, um, the, uh, just kind of, you know, his new struggle of like going out now so he can go out. He's well now he can go out and, and pick up guys, but it's a completely different like scenario. You turn that whole, you know, the, the whole dating scene on, on, on his head with that because he's now hunting for food as opposed to any love interests, you know, and it's, I, I, I love the wrestling, how the character's wrestling with that, um, with, with that aspect, you know, I, I, I mean, as a, as a straight, you know, person reading the story, I don't look at a book like, is this gay fiction? Is this straight fiction? I don't care. Like, is this a, is this a good story? And that's what Out for Blood is. It's a good story. And you can connect with the characters, you know, no matter their sexual orientation. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought it was just handled just so well. Uh, thanks. And a, a part of it just sort of also happens by accident in that, of course, this kind of reflects, you know, the, the period of my life that I had just been through the last previous couple of years before I wrote it, um, being at that time, you know, single and trying to meet people and mm -hmm. use the days before the internet and so on. And basically, you know, you just had to go out to, um, to gay bars or to dances at the university or social clubs or things like that, you know, to try to, uh, to meet people. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I wanted to work that element into it, um, as well. And then, um, you know, the the leukemia aspect, you, you may be getting to this in a, in a question, but uh, as I mentioned in my afterward, it wasn't intended originally to be that he was um, dying of, of AIDS, which at the time there was no um, curative treatment. Well, there's still no curative treatment, but there was nothing right. that um, you could rely on as, as a treatment. Um, didn't really have effective treatments until triple combination therapies in 1995. And I wrote this book in 89 and 1990, uh, there was, there were no dependable therapies for, for AIDS. So, um, he was going to be, um, um, 
you know, someone who had AIDS and was worried about being able to survive it. Um, and my publisher, you know, felt that this would make the book too political for them. Um, and as I said in my afterward, um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to change that, but I did. And I made it another blood disease, leukemia, uh, because it needed to be blood related. And, um, um, they, to their credit, they didn't make me change the other aspects of the story. So, um, the book ended up pretty much what I wanted it to be, but it was meant to be a sort of a parable, you know, of, the of the times. And right now there's, there's nothing in the book related to HIV. Um, and that's fine, but it wasn't what I intended to do originally. Did now working with the publisher, cause the, the, your first book, the lake was with, um, was it Avon, Avon, yeah. Avon books. Um, now, did they, was um, The Lake, so it was a contemporary horror story, um, were there gay characters in that one as well? Yes, yeah. Okay. There were gay teenagers and, um, okay. and people, yeah. Yeah, and so what, what I'm saying is like, um, so you never felt pressure from Avon to, for you to straighten anything up, <laughs> you know, even like you know, mm, a, no. a major publisher like that, but they did want you to kind of not address the AIDS uh, aspect, which is interesting. But I guess if you look at that time, you know, like AIDS came around, was it mid eighties? That Early, that, early eighties. Um, so there's still that stigma, I guess, because uh, it took them a couple of years to even figure out what was, you know, um, how to even yeah. approach it or what it was. Yeah, definitely. I mean, initially they didn't know how it was being transmitted. Um, um, there was beginning to be circumstantial evidence that it was a bloodborne disease. And at that time, the CDC met with Red Cross and other people who um, collect blood and tried to convince them based on their circumstantial evidence that this was um, a largely sexually transmitted disease, but also transmitted through needle sharing and so on. And it had to enter the bloodstream in order to infect the person. They knew that, and but uh, there was a lot of resistance so at the time, the blood supply was tainted with um, with HIV, and it took a long time for um, them to clean that up. They needed sort of proof that it was an actual virus that was transmitted, and that came around. But anyway, um, um, yeah, in the early 80s, there were lots of unknowns. Um, and then in the late 80s, we knew enough to know how to protect ourselves with safe sex and so on. But um, there weren't, you know, really effective treatments. Um, there were ineffective treatments. <laughs> but... Um, but the, from my perspective, as a young man who came of age in the midst of the AIDS crisis, it wasn't political. And so um, I was dealing with older people, you know, in New York publishing who had a different perspective, you know, and and for them, you know, it it touched on too many hot buttons for them to think that I, I'm I'm just imagining that this is what they were thinking, but it touched on too many hot buttons for them to put it forth as what they just saw as like a mass market, you know, horror paperback. Um, and so I think they want me to step away from that. So that was at the outline stage um, that I had mapped out what the story would be. And they just asked me to change that. So um, once I sat down to write it, I, I made it leukemia instead of um, and so I didn't have to change the whole book. Um, but I had changed my conception of it before I started on it. Was that something you were kind of adamant about? Was it hard for you to kind of, you know, find something else? Because um, I would imagine, like, because, like, AIDS makes so much sense in the story you're telling. I, leukemia does work, but as far as the thematic, you know, elements of the book and the time, it, it does make sense that you would, you know, have it be AIDS. Was it, did you... Uh, kind of go back and forth? Was it kind of a, you know, or, or was it something that you kind of had just to kill your darlings and darlings and, and just, you know, fix it for them? What, what, did you have any kind of back and forth with that or? Only, only a few discussions with my editor who's very experienced and who I respect very much. Um, but, um, you know, they probably weren't going to publish it if I didn't agree to change it. So I gave in. Um, but it was my idea to make it leukemia because it was important for me that it was related to blood. Uh, but another thing that was important to me, and this is kind of, you might think, a sort of silly or frivolous um, in my various opinions about vampires, I had noticed a trend in fiction while I was writing this that people were writing stories where the twist at the end of the story was, oh, the vampire bit someone who had AIDS. And so um, the vampire then got 
AIDS and was destroyed that way. This didn't make any sense to me. And there were several stories like this, even by prominent authors. Um, it didn't make any sense to me at all. And this is, it may sound, as I said, silly to you. But if you think about it, vampires have existed throughout, you know, these millennia, if you believe, you know, if you're following the mythology. And they have never been brought down by any human diseases, whether it's syphilis or, you know, or, or cancers or anything like that. So I didn't see any reason why AIDS would um, bring them down. And so if you were thinking that, then vampires were immune to this. That was the way out for Chris. So that was kind of the genesis of that. And that's what I was thinking of. And it was an escape route uh, for him as someone with an incurable disease. Uh, and luckily, we've made lots of strides with treating leukemia, different various types of leukemia since I wrote this book as well. But at the time, um, uh, the type of leukemia he had um, wouldn't have left him with many options. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects about this story, like you mentioned, was kind of the Russian aspect. And um, when I first read that, I was like, oh, no, I'm going to have to do a Russian accent in this. And then you specifically say that Temsik has... Uh, you know, European accent. So I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's been around so long. He's adopted a, a different accent. So I was very, uh, sure. Um, because I can do, you know, I don't know. I I, I need to ask my buddy Hannibal Hills uh, how my <laughs> British accent was because he's British. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's okay. I I, I do a, I do an okay job. I can I can get through. Um, but like just just with the. The history, and that, that's what I love, I think, about vampire stories. When you have an ancient or an older vampire who's lived through centuries and they have this kind of rich background. And I I loved the the Russian background. I loved and I hated it because I had to do a lot of research on how to present how to pronounce things and you know. Uh and I um I enlisted uh, help from um uh, from Roman Curis who wrote he wrote he's from Ukraine, wrote the book Infertat, and I texted him and I was like, I need help with some of these words because I know that you know Russian as well. And uh, he sent me some voice, some voice tracks and helped me out. But um, um, how did you just lock yourself into a library and just do a bunch of research on it? Or what was that process like? Because, you know, you said you wanted to give it a shot. It, I don't know if it was, you know, um, if you felt like you had to or you just kind of wanted to, but what was that process like? Did you get through it, start it and go, oh no, I'm in too deep, but I got to keep on going? Or what was that process like? Well, I think luckily since that was only about four or five chapters, uh -huh. it was manageable. Um, I did essentially sort of lock myself into a library. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love research and I love history. So um, it, what's interesting when you're researching a historical novel or historical story is the the, the details, the minutiae. Um, and when you're doing the research, you get off on tangents that bring you down other rabbit holes and other tangents. And you learn stuff that uh, maybe aren't important to a historian, but are really important details for a novelist um, to make things work. So I was reading both um, the nonfiction you know, history of the period I was writing about, as well as fiction from the time, like, you know, Pushkin and Lermontov and Gogol and, and other writers uh, who I also enjoy. And it was just, you know, it was something I was really into at the time. I'm still very interested in Russian history, but it was a joy to spend time with those books. Um, the, the next book I wrote after this was um, a, a complete historical um, crime story torsos about the Cleveland torso slayer in um, Cleveland in the 1930s. And that um, I definitely locked myself in a library to write right. because I had said it during the depression and I wanted to get all the details right. So um, that's enjoyable, but it is a mountain of work um, to, to do. But yeah, my first real attempt with that was in out for blood. I would send you stuff back and forth trying to you know, like help, help me, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but one example, something that I did, which is, you know, it's just me and, and the way I, I would work. Um, you know, I knew that in the early 19th century, it comes up in the fiction of the time and in some of the nonfiction. But a popular card game that people were playing was this was a version of Whist called Boston. Um, and and it was very, very trendy uh, among Russians at that time. So I thought, well, let's figure out how to play this. You know, and uh -huh. I didn't know anything played whist or Boston or anything, but I got the rules for Boston and I figured out how to play it. And I dealt myself loads of hands and I did the scoring and I figured out how to do all the 
stuff. And then I put some of that in the book, which probably was completely unnecessary, but, <laughs> um, but it was fun to do. And then I thought, well, I want to start a Boston club and play this card game with people. But uh, that's the kind of thing that I would do to kind of figure out what are they talking about. Yeah, well, that was fun because I, I mean, I had I learned a little bit about that, the card game as I was doing my prep. Um, and then uh, the food, man, you have a whole chapter where um, Temsik and Chris, like Temsik's cooking for Chris because Temsik is his, um, kind of becomes his, uh, um, you know, um, mentor. Uh, and so, you know, and they can't eat food. Their body cannot process digest uh food anymore only liquids they can i love that they can still drink alcohol i love that touch uh to the story <laughs> but he but there's this whole scene just about food and um it was a sunday morning and i'm doing the doing the prep and just looking up all this different food <laughs> and like getting hungry um how i mean at first you kind of think like as a reader, like, well, is this, is this necessary? Um, like what, what are your, do you wrestle with, did you wrestle with that? Um, I think it was important to him realizing like, this is stuff that I cannot have. Yeah. Well, Temsig was trying to make him understand that if this is serious, that he, you know, it's not just all funny games and that he had to give up a lot and he's stuck with it now. And, uh, not to punish him or anything, but to just help him understand the gravity and, and that he has to change the way he, he thinks. Um, I'm not sure if the way I did it was the right way to do it. One thing my editor pointed out to me in the editing process was that, you know, he's seen many other writers do this before, which is kind of fall in love with your research. And he felt I had done that, you know, a lot. So I, I tried to change that some in the editing of the, of the book, but I left in a lot as well. Um, and that is a danger. And I've, discovered that and since then when I've written other books requiring a lot of research, um, you find all kinds of fascinating things that you think are wonderful. Um, and the reader's not necessarily going to share your passion for it. So you have to be careful. There's a little bit of the element of kill your darlings to that. Uh, but, you know, to me, if it's a telling detail or something that brings it to life, you know, it's important to include. Um, but, you know, out for blood, I was... Um, I was 22 and 23 when I wrote the book and, you know, um, um, I learned a lot by doing it. I'm lucky. I think that it was published. Um, and, um, I think that I might have approached some of those things differently today, but I'm glad I did it the way I did. Uh, um, and yeah, I, you know, I think that, uh, well, um, all those details helped me. Um, but it's hard to tell what is going to ring true or be of interest to the reader, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think the, I felt as, as narrating, I, I felt that there was a good balance cause I, there are certain books that I, um, narrate and I'm just like, I'm still in this chapter. What is going on? Why is this taking so long? You know, is this necessary? I never felt that way, um, without for blood. I felt like, I um, I almost felt like just as I was going to get to that point, we would move on to the to the next thing. Um, what's very interesting about Out for Blood is that it changes perspective, and that's one thing. Um, I just got done reading um, the book um, Armor by John Stakely, and yeah. um, he does perspective shifts in that book. Now, Out for Blood is not as a, um, not as much perspective shifts, but there is a section in the book where we're reading, you know, a letter. Um, or, or uh, not a letter, but um, just kind of the writings of, of Temsik about his history, and um, and it, and it uh, let's see, it's towards the last part of the book, but we spend some time really getting to know the the history. Um, did you ha did you wrestle with when to put that in there, when to sprinkle that in there, or um, what, what kind of wrestling does an author do with that? Because for me, like the John's for John Stakely for armor it was a little jarring. Um, the, 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 the time shifts and the perspective shift this one, it made sense because Chris is discovering these writings. What was that process like when you knew you were going to have a perspective shift from kind of third person into kind of first person with, with Temsic? Yeah, I, I did wrestle with it a bit, partly because it was another thing that my editor pointed out to me because we go straight into this section and we don't leave it for four or five chapters. Um, 
And, and so he felt that maybe I should split it up, like alternate chapters between Chris and the historical part so that we don't completely leave Chris behind. Um, and I just couldn't figure out how to do that. So I, <laughs> so I didn't. Uh, uh, but by that point, I had just dived into this diary of, of Temsic and I wanted Chris to be immersed in it um, to learn that part of Temsic's history and then come out the other side. Um, so I never knew if that, you know, really worked or not, but my editor had encouraged me to do it differently. And I, that was a place where I said, I, I can't figure out. How to do it. <laughs> well, that's one thing that kind of, um, cause I, I'm a movie buff. So I watch a lot of movies and I, and I, you know, I have a history reading and I'm kind of this last year have kind of dived into the novel again. And it's interesting after you know, being involved with like movies and stuff, that sort of storytelling for so long, and then diving into this sort of sort of storytelling, which is a different approach. You have more time to to spend with characters. You have more time to kind of go off to the side and learn about a certain character or a certain part of the book that that may come in later. But it's you know, there's character development and stuff there. But the novel, you know, has that luxury of kind of building the characters that way. So for me, it's been a new thing to kind of rediscover with kind of how, you know, that storytelling is just different. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fun when you're a writer because you have to think about these things um, when you set out to do um, the book and a lot of readers don't necessarily um, care or pay much attention to it and just kind of let the writer bring them along. And I would say that in horror, the two best examples of a perspective shift I can think of is one Stephen King's Christine and, uh, and then Peter Straub's novel floating dragon. And they're two sort of opposites in a way, because in Christine, um, Stephen King starts the story in the first person. Um, and then when, the, when that character ends up in the hospital halfway through the story, it shifts to the third person where essentially this character was still telling the story, but he wasn't in any of the events anymore because he was in the hospital and he had to um, narrate the story in third person based on what he learned after right. the fact. Um, and then it goes back, I think, to first person later on. Um, and then Floating Dragon of Peter Straub is kind of the opposite where everything is in the third person up to a certain point. And then this narrator steps in halfway through the book and says, I'm actually the one who's been telling this story. And this is where I entered the story. So um, so that's fun. When you're a writer, you're always looking to see what other writers have done in terms of their tricks. Um, and I'm not sure always that, that a lot of readers either pick up on it or care um, too much. Mm -hmm. And I, and I wonder even from the, the audiobook perspective, um, if people can catch up on it. Now I, I had to change my <laughs> tone of voice and accent for those. So it was, you know, it's okay. We're in a new character. Um, I know that sometimes in, in an audiobook I'll get lost, um, with when, when I get those sort of perspective shifts and I'm kind of, Oh shoot, you know, what's going on or backtrack a little bit. Um, Obviously, like an author is writing for the, the page. Or, uh, authors aren't writing for the audiobook. Some do. I guess some do now because that's it's becoming more of a thing. Um, but but yeah, the, those perspective shifts are are great. And I think, like I said, I think this one. Um, I need to, I need to talk to. I'm, I'm going to be talking to Hannibal uh, this week, and <laughs> he's he's been listening to it, so I need to ask him like if it works or not. Um, but. Uh, but I don't know, you know, I, I gave it, gave it my best, but that, I think that was the longest sustained, uh, British accent I've ever had to do for anything. So it's just kind of <laughs> like keeping my fingers crossed, but it's kind of being in the character and, and doing it that way, which I love telling stories first person because be, first person, because that's an, a, a method of acting that I don't, you don't normally do as kind of a, de a detached, you know, um, yeah. third person narrator. So it's fun to be in, in their shoes. Um, well, that's the funny thing with audiobooks too, that, I mean, um, you know, writing a novel as opposed to doing a play or a screenplay, you know, we'd like to think of ourselves as, as we're doing it all ourselves. We're, we're creating the characters, we're doing the scenery, we, we do it with it all. But when it then becomes an audiobook, it's adventuring into that other realm where it becomes a collaboration. And, and the narrator is providing a different perspective and different color to the story through the way they narrate the story. So that's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it definitely is. Um, uh, I want to talk about Valancourt in just a second, but uh, but I know that when I was done with this, I was like, hey, John, do you want to hear it? You know, to, to kind of go through this. And you were you were kind of like, nah, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> It's not so much that I didn't want to hear your performances, like I didn't want to hear my own story. <laughs> no, right. 
back to me. Um, this is the one book of mine that I actually have gone back and reread a couple times for various reasons. Um, and I don't tend to do that with my uh -huh. books. And so it's kind of an old story for me. So I'm, I've listened to bits of it now and then I may listen to the whole thing someday. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's fun, but I, it's hard to hear your own words come back to you. Just right. For me. Yeah, no, I, and I, I totally get it. And I'm, I mean, I'm that way with, even re-listening to anything that I've created, I'm like, I don't want to go back and hear myself <laughs> do that. So especially earlier, you know, when I, the earlier books that I've first, you know, started narrating, but I, but I, a lot of creatives I think are, are that way. You know, if we create something, um, number one, it's hard to revisit an early piece of work that we've done. Um, number two, like it's even more. Uh, so I think hearing someone else interpreting <laughs> and you know, you're writing, which, you know, it's, uh, I totally get it. So, I mean, when you said that, I was like, okay, I, I totally get it. <laughs> well, when you, when you've got the story down on the page, you've finally got it out of your head and, exactly. you're, and you're, you're done. There's the editorial process too, of getting it into shape for publication, but yeah. you're already almost kind of lost interest in it because it's done. It's out of your head. And I ran into this when I wrote torsos about the Cleveland torso slayer. Cause I was very interested in the story and I was immersed in it. It's, it's a it's a novel, but it's based on a real life unsolved s series of murders. And afterward, everyone wanted to talk to me about the the torso slayer, and I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not interested anymore. <laughs> yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, when did uh, so when did, when did Valancourt, Valancourt Books um, approach you? Was it out of the blue? Um, because I know that they've, I mean, this wasn't part of the, so they have their paperbacks from hell line that they're doing. This would fit very nicely into that. They decided to kind of just do a re-release, which they've, I mean, they've, even before they started the paperbacks from hell, they would, they were releasing, you know, older books and things that they deemed like, oh, we need to kind of get, you know, this is something we would love to re-release. What was that process like with them? Did they just approach you one day or how did that? Um, I, I approached them. Um, okay. I've. I felt like Out for Blood was ripe for being reprinted, and mm -hmm. um, and I remember going to them. Partly it's too because uh, Valancourt is just the right fit for for me. Everything they yeah. publish is right up my alley. So whether it's um, legitimate old nineteenth century Gothic fiction, which I read, or rediscovered you know horror classics, yeah. or um, or a lot of British authors who are up for rediscovery and gay interest. Um, mm -hmm. Um, authors as well. All of that uh, jives with my reading interests mm -hmm. and my and my personality. So I thought Alfred Blood might be a good fit for their for their line. Um, so I proposed it. Okay. And um, yeah, and this came about before they were doing the paperbacks from Hell reissues, and so it kind of was before that program got right. off the ground. And and um, um, and that program is great too, but I'm fine not to be not to be a part of it too. Um, <laughs> The, um, and yeah, so, so they, they read it, you know, and then obviously were interested in making it part of their line because they thought that it fit. Um, and, and that's that essentially, but, nice. um, my tastes align with theirs and I buy a lot of their books. Um, oh, yeah. and so it was, I thought it was a good fit. Yeah. I was, I was overjoyed when, when, uh, James contacted me about this, about, uh, about this one, because, um, I saw, you know, when I auditioned, I saw the cover, which, which was the, the, the original Avon books cover. And, um, I was like, Oh, awesome. Eighties or nineties, something like that vampire book. I'm going to, I'm going to audition. And then, uh, they, you know, contacted me to, after the audition that I, you know, asked me if I would like to narrate it. And I was like, yes, yes, I would love to narrate this. Um, so yeah, working with them has been fantastic. I, I hope they, I hope they tab me for more things. We'll see. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm bugging, I'm bugging some people about it. <laughs> um, but uh, one, one thing I, we wrap. Uh, start wrapping up here soon. But one thing that I wanted to talk with you about um, is something that I think about, and um, you know, being a straight, you know, a straight male narrating this book, um, having this book be, you know, a, a, a LGBT fiction, you know, in that section, right, in that category. Um, I wanted to um, kind of get your feelings on like separating those categories, because to me, this was just a horror fiction novel. Hands down, the, the lead character is a, a gay character, and, and that's it. I had no issues, no qualms with that. Uh, and and I, but I under, also understand that representation, especially now, is very important. 
Um, what are your feelings on kind of those category separations? Because there's, you know, there's the LGBT horror category and then there's the regular horror. How do you feel about that? I mean, am I overthinking it? No, you're not overthinking it. I think that um, my, my initial answer is it comes down to these are essentially marketing categories mm-hmm. by the publishing industry. And um, it's a bigger problem or issue than just like LGBT, like horror itself. Mm-hmm. People have what to do do with for a long time. So some bookstores will have a horror section, some won't, and then the horror will be shelved with everything else. Um, Same thing with LGBT. Some bookstores will have an LGBT fiction section Mm -hmm. and um, um, sequestered from everything else. Um, So that it creates opportunities as well as problems. So if you're a writer like Edmund White, who's a really well established, um, you know, gay writer, uh, if you go into the fiction section and you look for Edmund White and you don't find it, well, it might be because it's in the LGBT section. But where should it go? Should it go in the main section or the LGBT section? How does the reader know where to, to find mm-hmm. it? Uh, so, so you know, publishers are just trying to make sure that their audience is going to find um, the books. There used to be a much more thriving sort of um, um, LGBT publishing scene in the sense of, brick and mortar bookstores that were right. gay and lesbian bookstores. Um, and those died out as things went through um, um, changes. But of course, now the whole field is thriving in a different way with the advent of self-publishing and people being able to get their more other unique stories out in whatever way they want, whether through a mainstream publisher or or something else. It's tough with a book like Out for Blood. Do you sell as a gay book, as a horror novel, or as a dark fantasy, or, mm-hmm. or what? And um, um, you know, because it's vampires, it falls most squarely with horror, but I would also like gay readers to know that it exists. Um, the, the original publication, you wouldn't have been able to tell from the cover that there were gay characters in the book. Um, and uh, so that's one reason I've wanted the book to be republished you know, someday in an environment where new people might find it who were interested. On the other hand, I also like the idea that my first two books, The Lake and Out for Blood, didn't reflect their gay content at all. And so we're sort of subversive in that lots of gay readers stumbled upon them by accident and yeah. then wrote me letters saying, oh my God, I love this book because there were characters I could relate to and uh, they were surprised. So those books um, actually reached some gay um, fans mm-hmm. um, in a unique way because it was kind of a stealth um, approach. But that wasn't my idea. That's just the, right. the way that the publishers published them. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I mean, I'm all for uh, a straight reader to all of a sudden be reading a, a gay sex scene. I'm all about that. Like, you know, that needs to happen yeah. more often. <laughs> you know? I mean, the thing is that, 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 that welcome to my world when I'm reading, you know, um, mainstream <laughs> fiction, you're reading Ken Follett or something right. and you have to wade through this straight sex all the time. Um, you know, um, it. I just skip over some of the pages. <laughs> Well, it was funny because I, I got out. Of, I I narrated that because there there is a a sex scene in in the in the book, and um I I got out of the booth and I walked. My my wife was making dinner, and I go, well, just narrated my first gay sex scene, you know. So it was, for me, it's a pretty proud moment. You know? Yay! <laughs> you know, because I I you know, being a narrator, you, you all the all sorts of sex scenes, and I done you know, it's always you know, straight couples or whatever, and and uh, I just. You know, it was, it's a, it's a sex scene is a sex scene. Sex is sex. So the fact that I, I was just happy that I actually had a different take on it from my perspective. It's fantastic. And like I said, the yeah. more, the more straight people you can kind of trick into uh, just it, it, there's, there's certain stuff that these stigmas that I think I'm a huge advocate for things that need to be kind of the, the stigma, all that it needs to be taken away. You know, th- this all needs to be normalized. You know, I'm. Um, a huge ally with my, for my gay friends and, and just, I don't, you know, uh, the, the more that I can do to kind of, you know, have a certain person read or hear a different perspective, I'm going to definitely do that. And, uh, th- that's what I, um, I don't know, I think that's what I loved about this book, especially because I think that anyone could approach this gay or straight and just see this story through this character's eyes and understand and that this, you know, it, the, the humanity of the character, you know, is definitely shines through everything else. 
and and I'm rambling. No, it's okay. What, I wanted to add something to that. Which I, I think that part of what I have always legitimately been trying to do, even from the early days as an author, as I said, I always wanted to be a, like a paperback horror author and the, mm. the horror market kind of vanished. I ended up doing crime fiction, but I'm, I like popular fiction. I read everything and I read classics and literature and all kinds of stuff, but I love popular fiction. Popular fiction, at least from, you know, the middle of the 20th century on, has always had a lot of sex in it, um, but not a lot of gay sex. And mm -hmm. either not a lot of gay characters or if you had gay characters in popular fiction, they tended to be villains. So you'd have um, very obviously gay, queenie kind of, mm -hmm. you know, evil people um, in spy thrillers and 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 all kinds of other things. And um, I didn't like that. So I wanted to have stories where the gay characters were the heroes, were the characters you sympathize with, mm -hmm. and then if they're going to have sex with someone, I wanted to include it and not just um, um, you know, make it a blank spot. Um, so I've always included gay sex in my novels because straight popular fiction included straight sex. Yeah. So uh, no one's ever asked me to take it out, um, and, and so it's there, but since the books aren't all, they're marketed more under their popular fiction genres like horror or crime than as LGBT books. So a lot of readers don't know it's there until they stumble across it. <laughs> have Have you had like the person mad that they were tricked into reading <laughs> reading a scene? If it, it, has that ever happened, you, or maybe the publisher sees that more than you? Um, the only only people who have ever been mad was due to a scene in Torsos, which is a very dark book, but. The, um, the scene was a sort of a weird, kinky scene. It wasn't necessarily a gay sex scene. Um, and it was something that was true to the history of the of the torso killer. Um, it was something the police ran across in their investigation. So I included it in the story um, and I brought it to life in maybe too dramatic a fashion. So that <laughs> scene shocked people and some people uh, my british publisher said that um uh, someone wrote them back and they were so upset by that scene that that um they wanted their money back and all that so they oh. sent free books so there there's a scene that upset people but it wasn't just a standard gay sex scene it was <laughs> uh i love it i love it i'm all and i'm that, all for the shock value for you know. yeah yeah. And, I, and some other people, when they reviewed my books, they said, why doesn't John Payton Cook just write the gay porn novel he's always wanted to write instead <laughs> of including it in in these stories? But I again, as I said, I think it's important when you read other popular fiction writers, they've got their yeah. straight character in sex. So I wanted to do the same in all of my books. And um, um, yeah, if people don't like it, they can skip those pages like I do for the straight books. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, we are running out of time here, John. Uh, I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time and talking to me about Afro Blood and, and your career and, and everything. But I wanted to give some time here because um, I know that you have been writing some, I think, short stories. Um, what have you been working on and, and where can people find you online? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, for the last you know 20 years or so, I've been very busy with my day job, with my career. So I haven't mm -hmm. got as much done. Um, I am working on a novel, but that was taking a long time. In the meantime, I've written some short stories. So um, there's three new stories that will be coming out. Two of them will be out this October. One will be in the Valancourt Book of Horror Stories, Volume 4, uh, which I'm very excited about because it's a really high quality um, series um, that they've been publishing. And yeah. the series only includes Valancourt authors. So I wanted to get in with a story and they've accepted one. So it's going to be out in October. Um, I have another story coming out from Lycan Valley Press in an anthology um, called Pink Triangle Rhapsody, which is kind of a cross genre LGBT anthology. So it includes, you know, horror and thriller and science fiction and other types of genres all together in one, but from a gay male perspective. Um, so I'm proud of the story I've included there. And uh, another story um, from the same publisher that's going to be in the Pulp Horror Book of Phobias, Volume 2. And I'm not sure the publication date of that one, but okay. either later this year or sometime in 2021, I think. Awesome. And uh, your website, John Peyton Cook, with an E, dot net. And then yeah. um, it's in, I think, your Facebook and then um, your Twitter is just your John Peyton Cook all the way all the way around. So I think people can find there. And if uh, I'll have links in the in the show notes here, so people can just click and follow you there. 
Yeah, and and um, I welcome people to follow me on Facebook. Um, I just maintain one site for fans, friends, family, and everything. Okay. An official author site, so um, so people can friend me there. Okay, awesome. All right, John, thank you so much for chatting with me, and uh, I, I look forward to reading the short, sto- short stories and anything else uh, that the novel, of course. And novels take time, but um, I'm I am here and ready to read it when it is re- <laughs> when you're done with it. So <laughs> one of one of these days. But thank you, <laughs> thank you for having me, Sean. It's been a pleasure. 